Hello, and welcome back to Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and today I am going over Jonathan Trance's favorite chess game of all time, or so I'm claiming. Uh, and this is something I wanted to do pretty regularly, actually. So if you guys at home have any favorite chess games of all time, leave them in the comments, and there's a pretty good chance that I'll eventually get to going over them. Uh, this is actually a game between Rubenstein and Georg Solway, maybe, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name totally. And uh, this is a game played all the way back in 1908 in Lodes. Uh, so we're going to see how this game went. It was d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, c5. And this is the Tarash defense. And this game has actually kind of become like a model for how to play against, uh, against this system here. Um, Rubenstein w played some very convincing stuff and uh, showed the, the serious deficits that can be, that can be made uh, against the Tarash system. Uh, in the game, he took on d5, black recaptures, and now simply knight f3. Uh, defending d4, you don't want to capture here right away and, and bring this bishop out all the time. Now black plays knight f6, getting developed. And now g3, knight c6, and bishop g2. And the point of white's play is that this d-pawn is a little bit weak, and so white wants to pile up against this pawn. This is why this bishop comes to g2 in this line, rather than a natural d3 square. Uh, black captures on d4. We see knight takes d4. We now have an isolated queen pawn. But after queen b6, we see a very common transition from the iqp to kind of a hanging pawn structure here where there are pawns on c6 and d5. White gets castled, uh, black plays bishop e7, and then white's next move is actually really important, and I wanted to, to talk about it a little bit. Um, with this pawn structure, uh, pawns on c6 and d5 like this, it's really unclear whether or not these pawns are going to turn out to be an advantage or a weakness. It can kind of go either way. Uh, one thing you don't want to do uh, is really kind of just like waste some time. Moves like this have been played before, but if you waste too much time just getting slowly developed, eventually uh, you're gonna see this pawn comes out to c5. And once these pawns uh, have gotten developed, although maybe you can't do it right away because this pawn might be hanging, uh, we'll say we'll give black a little bit more time with this move. And now we'll play c5. Once these pawns get to c5 and d5, they control a lot of central squares. And if these pawns can kind of maintain themselves uh, next to each other like this, it can be a very nice spatial advantage for black. Now, the opposite of this is if white can make sure that this pawn on c6 never can advance to c5, they're actually going to be a little bit of a weakness. Uh, white can kind of pile up against this weak c6 pawn in this weak c5 square and prove to Black that these pawns are, are definitely uh, a, a weakness, definitely a detriment to his position. And so because of that, White already goes for this move, knight a4. One, hitting this queen, and two, keeping an eye on the c5 square already. This is going to be the theme of the game. White tries to keep c5 under control and cramp the, the Black position. So Black plays bishop b or queen b5, rather. White brings this bishop to e3. Like I said, controlling the c5 square. Uh, black goes ahead and gets castled, and now rook c1. Every move for white you see piles up on this square. It's a very logical way of playing. And now uh, black makes a little bit of a mistake. Black plays bishop g4, which at first looks very, very natural, right? You're attacking this e2 pawn, and it could be a little bit awkward to defend it. You might have to play this move f3. And black was probably thinking, well, white doesn't want to play this move f3 because it stunts his own bishop. But in fact, uh, this was all part of Rubenstein's plan here. By playing f3, he allows this rook to advance to the f2 square. Not something you see every day, but in this case, it makes a lot of sense. This bishop's going to move out of the way, and the rook can actually swing to the queen side after this e pawn advances. And this is all really just giving white a path to add even more pressure to the c6 pawn. Uh, in the game, black came back to e6, and white now goes ahead and plays bishop c5, blockading the c6 pawn, making sure it stays there. Uh, we see rook e8, and now white does continue with this move, rook f2. Knight d7 is black's choice, aiming for the c5 square, trying desperately to regain control of it. We see bishop e7, rook e7, and now, of course, you want to control c5, why not queen d4? 
uh, all of the white pieces work together to achieve this goal of cramping the black uh, position. Uh, rook e to e8 is black's choice. Now we see bishop f1 preparing to, to advance this pawn. This rook now brings itself over to c8 to help advance this c-pawn. Of course, this a-rook is a little bit tied down by this queen on d4 as well. Uh, e3 is white's continuation, queen b7. Now, once again, uh, white blockades this pawn. Knight takes, rook takes, and really, white has forever uh, sealed the deal with this uh, c5 square. Uh, so, he's created a permanent weakness in the black camp now. All that's left to do is maneuver the pieces to the queen's side uh, to make sure that he can actually break through and win something concrete. And we'll see how he does that here. Rook c7, of course, the, this rook comes over to c2, as we expected. Uh, queen b6 is black's choice. And now b4 is white's move. Uh, already, white is making some very concrete threats on this queen side. b5 threatens actually to immediately win uh, this, this uh, c-pawn. Uh, also, there's no time to play a move like bishop b7, because a move like b5 would, would already be winning the game. So instead, we see a6 from black. Uh, this move, well, it does prevent uh, b5, it's not good enough for black. We see the very simple rook a5 attacking this a6 pawn, and it's very difficult actually for black to defend. He tries rook b8, uh, countering this threat with a threat of his own. But after a3, uh, this pawn is defended, this pawn is attacked, this pawn is attacked. A queen trade is also on the cards, and there's no way to defend everything. We see rook a7, rook takes c6 is a nice little tactic. Queen c6 leaves this rook hanging. Rook a8 was played. Queen, uh, queen back to c5, king b7, simply king f2, getting the king into the game, guarding some of these weak spots, and white is up a clean pawn. This pawn remains weak. This bishop sucks. This bishop's great. White is going to win this game. Uh, h5 is black's move. Simply bishop b2, g6, queen d6, and this pawn is hanging. Queen c8, rook c5, keeping the c file rather than being greedy and taking this pawn. After queen b7, we see h4. Uh, black tries a5, but now after rook c7, queen b8, uh, white makes use of this extra b-pawn and starts pushing it up the board. You see the white pieces very well placed to support these advances. And after a4, simply b6 and b7. And uh, black went ahead and, and resigned this game here. Uh, there's nothing left to do. No matter what black does, uh, white is going to be queening soon. And this was a very model game from uh, Akiba Rubinstein. Uh, showing how to play against this pawn structure how to organize your pieces against a weakness, and then to finally capitalize, win material, and go on to win the game. Uh, thank you for joining me this week or this episode on game review. As always, uh, I'll thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. You wanna try that again? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Okay. Uh, so Black went ahead and resigned in this position, uh, a model game by Akiba Rubenstein showing how to play against this weak pawn structure, placing your pieces around the c5 square, and eventually winning material and converting. Thank you so much for joining me this time on Game Review. My name, as always, is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.